I believed that only very rarely did people get sick from implants, which is not the case at all. Hundreds of thousands of women around the world are currently sick or dying from breast implant illness or the cancers and autoimmune diseases that come from it. Amber, welcome on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. So you've been spreading a lot of awareness over some of the issues with, with breast implants. Yes. And how that goes. I know mm. a lot of people, friends of mine, females who have it, yes. they're kind of argumentative about it, like, oh, it's fine. So what was your experience with it? How did it go for you? And why, what are some of the issues those who have it should look out for? Yeah. So um, I got breast implants when I was like 19 years old, oh. and it was something that I really felt I needed from me. I felt really insecure about how flat tested I was. Like I grew up, my sister was that way. I was that way. My mom was that way. Like I pretty much knew by age 18, like this is what I got. <laughs> and I I wasn't happy with it. Like I, I was very much um, in the era. And, and during that time, it was very much like, it was very common for women my age and in like our 20s to be getting breast implants. It was kind of like all the rage. It was kind of like the Victoria's Secret age when everybody was like idolizing the, the Victoria's Secret angels. And and it was all about big boobs and tiny waist yeah. and all that. And that was just kind of the era. And so it wasn't really that weird at the time to like think about doing that. But I didn't know the risks that were involved in it. I think I knew. Um, and the plastic surgeons don't do a good job in educating women because they make millions of dollars off of these surgeries, you know, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So they, they're not really too concerned in giving you all the information. And back then also, they probably didn't have a lot of information to give us, honestly. But um, I wish I'd done more research back then on the potential negative health side effects of implants. But what I knew at the time was that um, you could have rupture, which means they break and they leak inside of you. Um, or you could have like a, what they call a capsular contraction, which is where it basically like, there's like a um, scar tissue that forms around it and it starts to be really painful and really tight. And you ultimately have to have them removed and replaced and things like that. So there wasn't any talk about like developing cancer or autoimmune diseases or anything other than those two things. And so I was like, cool, let's do this. Like, great, I'm gonna have nice boobs. And um, so I had them for 18 years and I should have had them removed at the 10 year mark because you're supposed to replace them every 10 years. Um, they're not lifetime devices, but I also um, was very afraid to go under the knife again because I had such a traumatic experience the first time that I had that when I had the implants put in. Um, I had an experience where I couldn't basically take any of the pain meds afterward because they made me really nauseous. I'm pretty sensitive to any pharmaceutical drugs in general, but, um, and I learned that through this experience, <laughs> but, um, after the surgery, I was in so much pain, but I couldn't take pain meds. And so I was in basically like intense pain for like two weeks after. And so that was pretty traumatic for me at such a young age. And so anyway, fast forward 18 years later, I was in a place where, um, my health started to deteriorate really quickly. And this happened, it was about a year and a half ago now. So I just had my son. I just gone through like postpartum, um, which is really intense in and of itself. And I had just gotten COVID. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my body just started to shut down. And I didn't know what was going on. Like my appetite disappeared. Um, I could only digest certain foods. Um, and this, had, this was slowly building over that like six months prior where I was like getting really anxious and I didn't know why I was anxious all of a sudden. I was dealing with depression. I was losing weight. I didn't know, even though, even though I was continuing to eat my normal food, I was still losing weight. And I was like, what is going on? And then the chronic fatigue hit and I was fatigued all day long. I could barely function. And the anxiety was got to be so bad that I was like afraid to close my eyes to go to sleep at night. I was afraid to leave my house. Like, I was like, what is going on? My body is like falling apart and I don't know why. And it was happening so quickly. And so what I've learned from that experience and what I've like learned from doing a ton of research about breast implant illness is that it can happen like that really quickly, even if you've not had like a ton of signs leading into it, because it's like your body has like a a bucket of, of toxins that it can tolerate. And when that bucket gets too full, it spills over and it can cause like really intense health issues really quickly. And that's basically what happened is my bucket got too full and all of a sudden my, my body started to shut down. And so I booked the surgery like three months out from where I started to feel really sick. And I was like, I'm, I'm praying it's my breast implants because I don't know at this point. At that point, I had no idea what was going on. And I knew like my blood work was pretty good. And 
And I was like, okay, so there, there was only like two markers in my blood work that showed me or showed my functional medicine doctor at the time that there could be something going on with my implants. And that was that my lymphocytes were really high and my blood platelet levels were low, which told her that my body had been fighting something for a very, very, very long time. And basically my immune system was like really depleted because of that. And she's like, you don't have an acute, an acute infection that I can see because you don't have high blood, uh, white blood cell counts, a uh, white, uh, high white blood cell count. But these other markers are showing me that you have like, you've been, your body's been fighting something for a really, really, really long time. And so she's like, that's a really clear indicator. I see this with women with breast implants. And I was like, oh shit. And I'd already been wanting to get them out. But like I said, I was like really afraid to do it. I was afraid of the healing journey afterward, the physical healing journey, the mental emotional process I'd be going through, trying to figure out how to love myself again with no boobs. Like I just, I had a really hard time, like, like wrapping my head around how that was going to happen. And I was also afraid of the surgery. And so I kept putting it off and kept putting off, but obviously I got to a place where I couldn't put it off anymore. And so the, I had the surgery and the surgery itself was really, really intense and traumatic for me because I was very afraid to, to do it. And, um, and post-surgery was definitely the most intense healing process I've ever been through in my life. Um, sorry, I just got to feel this for a second. I can feel it's okay. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, it brings up a lot of emotion because it was a really painful time in my life. Um, Why is it still so intense for you still? Because it's still very real for me. In what ways? Um, it's still very fresh that even though it was a year ago, it's very fresh um, that the emotions are still are still there to some extent. How, how challenging and how painful it was. And so I want to talk about it because I think there needs to be awareness around it. Yeah. And what I struggle with is that it still brings up some intense stuff for me. Yeah, take your time. I'm with you. I think yeah. just witnessing you feeling it is powerful enough in itself. Yeah, no, I think I think it is too. What was, the, what was the specific super hard part about it? Was it more so the mental, emotional side of things? It was, honestly. Like, the physical stuff, like, the reason I, I knew it was my breast implants the minute I woke up, because I instantly knew that I was healing when I woke up. It was like my body went from knowing that I was dying, like, like my soul, like, very much knew my body was shutting down. I woke up that morning, and I went uh, after surgery, and I knew I was healing for the first time. And my body was like, thank God. Like, it was like this, my body just thanked me, like, internally. Thank you so much for getting rid of these these things. And over the next six months, it was really, it really showed me that it was my implants because all my symptoms went away, except for the um, nervous system dysregulation, which I'm still dealing with, which is mm -hmm. uh, anxiety and my body gets um, stuck in a fight or flight response. And I'm having, I've had to relearn how to basically regulate my nervous system. Yeah. And... <sighs> And so, you don't have to hold back. You can let it out. I know. I know it sounds super frustrating and intense. Yeah. Um. The the most challenging aspect was the mental emotional work because, and the nervous system regulation work because, when your body's stuck in a fight or flight response, you it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter oftentimes what you do. Like your body is stuck in a in a space. And so you have to learn how to regulate. You have to learn new tools. Like I had to learn all new tools to like help myself stay grounded and stay present because it's like um, what I would go into is almost like a dissociated state where my soul would actually kind of felt like my soul was kind of leaving my body to get out of the pain or to get out of the fear. And so I had to learn to like stay in the room and stay grounded and like how do I feel the emotions and process them and move through them and not be afraid of them. And so I went through... Um, what I felt like months of deep clearing, um, of grief, of sadness, of anger, of rage, um, because the implants block your heart chakra. And so for 18 years, my heart chakra was blocked. And so if you can imagine 18 years of grief, sadness, anger, frustration, overwhelm, like 
all the sad, challenging emotions, and also the, the loving emotions, right, that we feel through our heart, all of that was somewhat altered or imbalanced or thrown off or blocked, right? And so what happened is the floodgates opened. As soon as those implants were out, it was like, whew, like years and years of emotion that needed to be processed came through. And it's a really common experience to hear women who've gone through explant share that story. We're like, they're like, oh my God, I didn't even know that all this was there. I had no idea that all these emotions were there to be felt. And it was so overwhelming. And it's like, yeah. And then all the guilt and shame that you carry around doing this to yourself, right? Like I chose this. I chose this. I chose those implants. And so there's a lot of guilt and shame around. I did this to myself too. Well, you know? What would you tell your 19 year old self in that moment? If she was about to get surgery to, to kind of push her away, what did she need to hear? She needed to hear that she was enough. She needed to hear that she was beautiful. No matter what her body shape was, that men were going to love her no matter her body shape. Um, I didn't get them for men, but I got, I got them for my own self-confidence, but I do know of course that they, that was correlated with how I was, how I thought I'd be attractive to men for sure. Um, and so, you know, she needed to hear that a man was going to fall in love with her for exactly who she was. She didn't need to alter her appearance to be loved and to be seen, to be valued and to be respected. And I really didn't know that back then. And I think at the time, my mom did the best that she could with me and my sister. My sister also got breast implants at the time. And we were both so insecure about our bodies that she she just was like, well, if this is going to make you guys feel more confident, like, why not? You know? And I think that's the mindset I went into it with too. And that makes sense to some degree, but really what I needed to hear was you're more than enough, babe, and you don't need to do anything. You're so beautiful. Um, and, and that's the messaging that we need to be putting out there right now for young girls. Yeah. What was the work you did to give yourself back that confidence? In other words, yeah. what do you recommend to people who, you know, women, a lot of women who feel like they have to get work done, they have to get yeah. implants or surgery. Yeah. What's the work they, sh they have to do or should do to get to a place where they love themselves as they are? Yeah, it's tremendous inner work. And I think it's really challenging nowadays with the way that our society is shaping us and the media and all that. Um, what I've had to do is really just um, sit with the hard stuff, sit with the insecurity, sit with the anger, sit with the the uncomfortable emotions that people don't want to feel. You know, you look at yourself in the mirror and you hear all the negative thoughts and the things that you're saying about yourself and you feel all these emotions. And People will do anything to escape their emotions, myself included, for most of my life. <laughs> and so if you're willing to sit with the hard stuff, that's how you can move through it. And I think that so many people are not willing to do that. And that's why they stay. That's why they start to choose all these things to make themselves feel better when really they can just sit, move through these emotions. And on the other side of it is clarity, is peace, is connection to self, is, you know, all the things that they're wanting, but they're they're avoiding it. By him, so you're saying him. that what right here in my experience too is that there's actual insecure thoughts you have and there's the emotions in the body and the trauma that causes those thoughts so right. you're arguing that the journey towards healing that insecurity is, is sitting and tolerating the pain that came with it correct so what was that pain when did that pain for you start like where you started feeling insecure what, oh gosh yeah good question um <laughs> i think i think a lot of that started so i grew up as a dancer which um is a beautiful industry for the arts, but not for self-esteem. <laughs> um, so I grew up as a dancer. Um, my parents put me in ballet when, when I was age three, and I was a really talented dancer right out the gate. And so I went on to dance um, competitively from age, like, I think I got into competitions around like seven or something. So seven to 18, I was dancing competitively. And let me tell you what staring in the mirror at your body every day does to your psyche and what when you're comparing yourself to your other girlfriends and you're competing against other women and you're getting judged on your, not only your physical expression of your dance, but on your body. I mean, man, that industry is so brutal. It's like the modeling industry. It's like, if you don't have a certain body type, man, they are sure to tell you that you are not the right fit for that job or that role because X, Y, Z, you need to lose 10 pounds. And so growing up, um, luckily I didn't have a lot of choreographers and, and people that were like that towards me, but it was in, it was just in the ethos of that, of that industry that like, you're looking at yourself in the mirror every day, you're wearing tight, you know, sh little clothing, you're working on your body constantly, you're an athlete, you're competing with other women. And so that was just like how I grew up. And, um, and I was, I went on to dance professionally. Um, after college, I went to dance for college, um, got my degree in dance performance and choreography, and then went on to dance professionally in San Francisco for eight years after that. And so that was my life until I was like 28 years old. And for a while, I thought like, oh, I'm not going to ever let this industry get to me. Like when I was in my teens, I was like, I'm stronger than this. Like, I know that, you know, none of this is getting, I have such a thick, 
thick shell and such a tough skin. You had to learn that at, in that industry. You had to learn that like, if I get rejected for whatever reason, like, I'll just let it roll off my back. But the reality is that it does. It does sting you. And if you're really real and you're really honest about like what it feels like to be rejected that much, like when you're really like expressing your soul through dance and someone's like, nope, that's not enough, right? Nope, that's not enough. Nope, you need to do that better. No, you jump higher. Nope, do this, do that. Like when you're constantly being critiqued and judged, um, it gets to you after a while, no matter how thick your skin is. And um, so for me, uh, that developed into an eating disorder in my early twenties. Um, I was bulimic for five years and like, I would say got to a pretty severe stage of bulimia. And so I had to heal myself through that journey as well. And that was a super intense process too. But like that, that I think the root of that not enoughness very much came from my upbringing in that industry. I grew up, my sister had severe eating disorder growing up. So I was yeah. around that. Yeah. That's pretty, it's witnessing it, it's a pretty brutal experience. What, what, how did you get out of that? What were some of the yeah, things you, so, you did to heal yourself from that specific, specifically? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know how to fix it. My family didn't know how to fix it. They were kind of hands off about it. They check in with me a little bit about it. And did, they you know knew. It was, did you know it was an issue? Like, did you realize yet it was an issue? I, I definitely knew it was an issue, okay. but I didn't know how to get out of it. Okay. And I didn't know. Um, I was afraid to lose weight. I was afraid to gain weight. I was afraid for people to be like worried about me. I was living in a very, very intense state of fear, basically. A, a cage of fear is what I'd like to call it. And I didn't know how to get out of it. And so... What actually was the turning point for me in my healing journey with bulimia was sitting with ayahuasca. That was a huge um, transformation for me. My first ceremony taught me so much about how much I hated myself and how much like this self-destructive pattern was killing me. And it was because I didn't love myself. And so I had to learn through my work with, with medicine. And I learned a lot through my work with medicine, like how to love myself and how to really... Um, love all aspects of me, not just the good parts, but the, the hard parts too. That's pretty heavy. What did you feel like after that when you first realized that you hated yourself in some way? What was that like? Yeah, I was like, oh, I didn't, like, it was kind of like, I didn't realize, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much I hated myself because my internal self dialogue at the time, I wouldn't have said was really brutal, but it was like the lifetime of all of the judgment and the, the, um, you know, the stuff that I got from other people, the external projections I got from other people, but also like, I didn't realize how much, how internal it was. I didn't even realize I was doing it to myself. It, w it was, so it was really shocking, honestly. I was like, I mean, I kind of knew it because I was like in an eating disorder, but I didn't, um, it was hard for me to like really see it. Yeah. Have yeah. you seen the movie Black Swan before? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Sounds familiar to me because the concept I picked up in that is that, you know, the, the story is a, there's usually like a light, angelic, perfect dancer and there's a darker one who owns her darkness. And right. The light one becomes ends up becoming more dark because her addiction to perfection right. becomes the biggest shadow. Yes, so very much. So. How are you doing with that now? Are you? Because I feel like that was something driving that force, wanting to feel and look, very much look perfect so. in a way. Oh, very much so. How, are you still dealing with that? How are you bypassing that now? Gosh, you know, I I perfectionism is something I've worked on for so long because I was a Type A workaholic perfectionist for sure, through and through. It used to take me like three hours to write a blog post because I was like, I'm so worried about what other people are going to think about my blog post. This is when I started writing online like, I don't know, 16 years ago now when I first got into writing online. And um, luckily, thank God I had that as an outlet because it actually really forced me to deal with my perfectionism. Having an online presence, writing social media posts, it definitely exacerbated it to some extent, my perfectionism, but it also taught me a lot about like getting over my own shit in order to be able to put myself out there. Um, and so business really taught me that too. So I feel like I learned a lot through that. Like I have to const constantly be putting myself out there and, and risking being seen and risking failing and all those things. And, and you can't do that if you're a perfectionist. Um, but I think, you know, my work with ayahuasca really taught me a lot about releasing this control I had over my life and this need to control everything um, and really helped me reprogram the thoughts like there my thoughts um, around eating and around my body like the stuff that used to just run in my head on loops is just gone now and I don't know the magic of medicine I don't know how that happened but it's it has happened it also has happened because I'm like a devout yogi and I'm a meditator and I eat really clean and I take great care of my body but like definitely the the magic of working with medicines is something i i don't think we can ever really fully understand but um it's magic to me that the thoughts that used to loop in my head are no longer there the thoughts about like worrying about like what i'm eating and how i'm eating it i mean the obsessive thoughts I used to have about food were just all consuming like they would be for any sort of addict right it's like you're constantly thinking about 
what you're going to eat, how you're going to eat it, what quality it is, when you're going to throw it up. When like, I mean, it's just all day, every day. It's yeah. so consuming. Yeah, I, I was a drug addict. I think what what helped me, I'm probably similar to you, was doing everything I could to expel the pain causing the thoughts from my body. Yes. So that was like, I didn't realize that for a long time. I was doing the traditional, like, you know, talk therapy, all that kind of stuff. And then right. once I really started going into the body and releasing it, now all those thoughts and cravings went away. Right, right. So you did, you were doing somatic work, I'm imagining, right? You're like yeah, feeling yeah. and processing stuff, totally. Yeah. But what about the psychedelics? Was it which is ayahuasca mainly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that just, that was, you give that credit to being the main. Absolutely. Healer. That was like my main focus. So I, I dove deep into medicine work for about seven years and I, I ended up leading ayahuasca retreats, not serving medicine for sure, but facilitating retreats. So at the time I was living in Costa Rica, I was running a wellness center down there. I was producing health and wellness retreats. I was teaching yoga and Pilates and plant-based nutrition. I was doing all these teacher trainings and retreats. And I, when I started working with medicine, I then started to, a couple years later, started integrating it into my retreats and then led people to these experiences and helped them transform, heal, and awaken through these, these processes. So I, I have a really devout connection to ayahuasca and it's been my, my guiding force for a long time during that chapter of my life. And I really feel like that chapter is closed in my life, but it was definitely the primary medicine for that chapter. So no longer, no more psychedelics? No, no. Yeah. No, and I think it's just because my life has felt like a psychedelic journey for the last <laughs> couple of years that I'm like, I don't need anything else. I'm good. I'm good. Life is challenging enough right now. And becoming a mom was definitely like, okay, like I'm in a medicine journey 24-7 and um, I'm just trying to stay grounded in this. Yeah. yeah same here. I, I quit them about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Just because I realized that I kind of have to master this 3D game. That's it. You know, that's it. That's you the have work. to. Yep. Yeah, that's the work. And, and I think for many years, I... I sat out of, um, I sat with my, my groups out of, um, obligation and not out of like my own wanting to sit. And, and that just comes with like the territory of you wanting to serve and hold space for people and help them transform. And I, um, so I have a very similar, like you said, like, I feel like I got to a point where, um, I wasn't integrating all the lessons I was learning. I wasn't embodying the lessons I was learning. I wasn't giving myself time. I was just like every month, every, you know, just sitting, 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 sitting. And I wasn't giving my, my body the time and space to integrate that stuff. And that's, I think the big issue in that whole, in that whole realm, in that whole space, people working with medicine. Yes. Yeah, addiction to discovering things and being aware. Yes. But then, you know, I think psychedelics gave us a blueprint of what we have to do in, in reality. Right. And then the 3D is walking through the fire to integrate all that and, and to download it. So for me, I got the same message over and over again. Right. But I was too addicted to, to hearing it and like being in that in that state of like, oh, of, of, right. of amazement and connection. And yes. then I was like, I feel like that's the next evolution of where we're going. So yeah. right now I have to be comfortable and, and, and master this, this dense physicality. Absolutely. First, you know? Absolutely. And if we can't master this, then what are we doing here? I mean, I feel like that, that's why we're here. And, um, and I, I too love the connection and I, and I, you know, I think there's a part of us that feels like maybe we, we, maybe we can't connect if we're not working with medicine. We can't yeah. connect in that way. And that's just a lie. Like we can connect anytime yeah. through meditation, through lots of different things. But I think it's, um, yeah, that's the work. The real work is to be human and to yeah. feel all the shit that we don't want to feel and to heal and to transform and all the things that we're learning how to do through ceremony. Yeah, so well, when you were in that height of breaking down from health. Yeah. How was it having that and managing a family, like being a wife and a mother? Yeah, uh, I mean, that that was one of the, again, like under another really challenging part is that my son was only a year old when I started to go through this. So I had just finished breastfeeding with him. And that was when my anxiety started to really kick in because my hormones did a big switch, which they do when you stop breastfeeding. And so I was like, how do I raise my son? How do I like, I mean... Luckily, he wasn't walking quite yet. Like he did start walking along the way, but I had to take a month off of basically raising my son during the recovery period because I couldn't actually pick up um, anything heavier than 10 pounds. And so I had to just go, okay, like this is so hard for me. I love my son so much. I want to be with him. I want to be with my husband, but I had no capacity, like literally no capacity. I would sit in our media room and watch HGTV for like eight hours a day because I just couldn't function. I was so fatigued and so sick and so emotional and processing all this stuff. And so I just sat there and like painted. I, I found ways to keep myself busy, but I was literally going crazy because I just don't, I'm, I'm a mover. I need to move. I need to work out. I need to be with people. Like, you know, I, like, so it was really, really challenging for me to not be able to take care of my son, to not be able to be there with my husband, to not help him with my son. So, um, luckily his mom came in and stayed with us for a month afterward, which is so great. And she helped, she's like, 
the most incredible um, help ever. She's she's the type of grandmother that wants to be with her son 24 seven or her her grandson 24 seven. So it was so fun to be able to have her there and she helped with everything. So really grateful for that. And now you, now you have the space to kind of restore those connections where you can fully be present with them. Absolutely. Yeah. So after that first month, like when things were really challenging, um, things got so much better and I was able to basically be mom again and engage and pick him up and all that. Cause after the surgery, um, my implants were under my, my pec muscles. And so the pec mu muscles actually have to reconnect back to the rib cage in order for you to be able to pick things up again. So, um, yeah, so it took me like a month or so to like really be able to pick him up again. But after that, things have been good, but still it's been a roller coaster. You know, the healing journey has been <sighs> some days, some days, some weeks I'm doing really great, feeling awesome on fire. And then other days I'm down, I'm detoxing, my body is going through stuff. And I just have to be like, babe, like, I'm sorry, I need to like chill out for six hours. Can you take Wilder? And so that's been challenging on our relationship for sure. Cause he's just like trying to hold and support. And he's like, what do you need? And you know, we're trying to figure that out. What, what are ways you're making it work? For yeah. I think, um, one thing that we've gotten really good at is communication. We've had to get really good at communication and asking for help, like me hiring in more support. So hiring in nannies, um, like we have a, a basically a full-time nanny. She's with us like 35 hours a week, um, Monday through Friday. And, um, and just a lot of communication and we have a, a great full-time assistant. He's got an amazing team. So we've had to really just bolster our support systems and also really get clear about how we're going to take the best care of ourselves and prioritizing our self-care. And that's something that I feel like we're just now getting really good at now that our son is like two and a half. We're like, okay, we're over the intensity of like the initial baby phase and we figured out our flow. But like we both have learned so much how much we absolutely have to prioritize self-care or we are nothing for each other. We are nothing for our family. We're nothing for our businesses, right? So that has become like the forefront of everything. With your history of perfectionism, how hard was it for you to let things fall apart? Oh, man. I mean, I think all my medicine work taught me how to let things fall apart um, but and how to surrender. But I think this was a whole new level of surrender because my body like wasn't functioning. And so I had to really figure out a way to love myself in the in the like the depth of my body can't do anything. Like I was so frustrated with my body. I was so annoyed that I wasn't like through this healing process already. Right. And so I was battling like in my head, like, okay, I know I need to heal. I need to have patience. I need to like take this slow and I need to listen to my body and trust its guidance and all this stuff. And at the same time, so frustrated that it was taking so long. And so, um, all, all this work has been is, is about surrender and trust and, and like faith that like things are going to work out and there is going to be light at the end of the tunnel. And, I just need to trust the process. What are the most important lessons, if any, that you learned throughout that that period of dev devastation? Um, I think my my greatest um, like I, I learned how to love myself in in the ugliest I've ever been. The not the ugliest, but like the the, the lowest I've ever been. Let's say. Like looking at myself in the mirror, like I was 17 pounds thinner than I am right now, which is kind of crazy to think because I'm already naturally really thin, but like 17 pounds thinner was like terrifyingly skinny. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and being like, you look like a skeleton. This is like terrifying. Um, but figuring out how to love yourself through that has been like the work has been the work. Um, but also I think that like the greater, bigger lesson that I've had to like, that has really shattered everything in terms of like, because everything came up for review during this time. Everything came up for review. All of my relationships, my work, my like transition into motherhood. Like I was questioning and considering everything. Like, is this really what I want to be doing? Are these the people I want in my life? Like everything started to come up to be questioned. And through all of that, the takeaway lesson was how much I have self-sacrificed in my life for my work, for my husband, for my son, for my friends, um, and how that played out through all of these different avenues. And so that's been the biggest takeaway is like, oh, wow, like I have self-sacrificed so much to the point that I'm so depleted energetically, physically, um, that that's why I'm here to some extent. You know, that's why I'm in this place is because I have self-sacrificed too much. In what ways were you self-sacrificing? Um, just not honoring my body's needs. Like, for example, like, postpartum with my son, you know, he's up every two hours at night. I'm extremely sleep deprived. Me trying to find ways to get things done while he's sleeping when I should be sleeping, you know, not taking the time out to like make solid meals or hire a meal service to make sure that I had three meals a day, like just those sorts of like self-care things. 
it's like when you're a new parent, you're just like, I'm just in survival. I'm doing whatever I can to just get through the day and like eat a burrito over here and have a smoothie over here while I'm like nursing my baby. You know, it, it feels so intense trying to figure all that out. And so I realized how much I was over giving in order to like be the best mom and take care of my son in the best way ever. But in, in the process, I was self-sacrificing. I wasn't really honoring my needs. I wasn't really honoring what my body needed for sure. And I tried to do some, but it just felt like it was impossible. What's your journey out of that now? Is it, is it just like being honest? We need, we need space or help or yeah. taking time away from, from those yeah. responsibilities? Yeah, it's like just being really, I, it's listening to my body and tuning in and going, okay, like what do I need today? And for someone like myself who tends to overgive, tends to be a people pleaser, tends to like self-sacrifice, my work is to be more selfish actually. Um, And to not think of it as selfish, but to think of it as I need to fill my cup up so full that I am in overflow. And if I'm not in overflow, then I'm not going to be the best for myself, my son, my husband, for my friends, nobody, right? And so that has been, I'd say like my life's work is figuring out how to love myself and how to like stop being a martyr in my life. Um, And and um, that's just the way the way I've been. And so I'm, my, my work is to go, okay, how do I prioritize me today? And so what I've been doing since we got through our big renovation and everything kind of slowed down, I'm like, okay, this next year plus is all about me. I'm diving into tons of self-care. I'm doing a huge detox. Uh, right now I'm diving into that, which is um, getting rid of all the heavy metals and toxins that are in my body from the breast implants. So I actually have really high levels of lead and cadmium and nickel and um, um, what was the other? barium in my system right now. And breast implants leach 40 plus toxins and, and heavy metals. And so I know that a lot of that is from my, he- from my breast implants and also from potentially other factors as well. But primarily the breast implants. And so I'm going through now like a probably a six month process of healing my gut, getting rid of the heavy metals, killing off the candida and SIBO and any parasites in my system so that I can fully be back to like my full health. Because though I feel like I have a lot of mental clarity and energy right now, it's not at all where it used to be because my body is still really fighting to clear all this stuff out. And so that's what I'm focusing on now. I'm working out every day. I'm going to hot yoga. I'm going, I signed up for a yoga teacher training program. I'm doing a somatic course. Like I'm just so excited to be diving all back into me and prioritizing me for the first time in the last like two and a half years since having my son. And I feel like that's something that every mother needs because I think that um, what I see and through my own experiences, mothers are, are, you know, devout to their children and they are the first to self-sacrifice, the first to say, you have have my food if you're hungry and I'll go hungry. You know, it's like, that's just, I think the nature of being a mom, but at what cost, right? And um, that's a self, that is that self-sacrifice piece is how much self-sacrifice are you going to do before you run yourself into the ground? And I see that happen so much with new moms specifically. But deeper than that is I think whatever wounds or tendencies you don't heal, your kid downloads. Absolutely. In some ways. So that's probably the biggest motivator. How's it, it, has it been for you and, and thinking that has it been a mo- motivator for you thinking that, you know, I have to heal these things and, and clear myself so my kid doesn't get this stuff? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, that is like one of my my driving forces in my life, I would say, in general, is clearing generational trauma yeah. patterns. Like I I love my parents, they did the best they could, but I don't want to play out a lot of the patterns that they did. And in, that's in my marriage, that's in my self-care, my self-work, that's in um, you know my dynamic with my son, how I want to show up for him. And it's constant work. And, and that's why I mean, like, once you have a child, it's like you're in in a medicine journey, because you're like, whoa, there's so much going on. I'm feeling all of this pressure from, from my own past and learning more about my own inner child and my past and how that's correlating to how I'm being a parent right now. And it's just like this. Yeah, it's kind of this bizarre situation where you're trying to teach and guide and be there for your son at the same time you have all these patterns you're trying to deprogram what has your kid taught you so far about love and and the nature of oh my gosh humans you know yeah i think i think children teach us love i think that we we think we know love before we have kids like oh god love with my partner love with my pets whatever the love you have for your children is about a hundred thousand times more than that and so you don't at least that's my experience. And I don't, I don't think that we really know love until we know the unconditional love that we have for our children. Because there's a reason that parents will do literally anything for their children. They will run in front of a speeding car to save their child. Like That love is just unbelievably uh, powerful. And so he's taught me what love is. Um, and every time I see him like speak a word or like do something new, my heart just goes... Pfft 
every time. And I'm like, wow, this is such a wild, cool experience to get to like witness this being like grow and evolve and become themselves. It's, it's such a cool thing. And so he's really, I see him as our greatest teacher and we're just kind of like guiding and supporting and like, but he's, he's teaching us so much about how to play, how to like be present, how to be awe inspired by life again, you know? Um, so he really brings out my inner child. Like every time I spend time with him, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so fun. I get to play tag. I get to play hide and seek, like all the things that maybe I didn't really get to do as a kid. I get to do with him. And that's been really, really fun to like tap back into that. I'm going to give you a break to digest all this amazing information. And in this break, please comment, like, and subscribe. Thank you. I think we repress that because we've, we've been, it's been beat out of us in yeah. society, right? Like work hard, make money, pay your bills, climb the corporate ladder, whatever all that societal programming is like. And, and I think that's the beauty of having kids is that they remind us of what really matters and um, why we're really here. And, and like the small, simple things in life are the most important. Like the things that I love the most now is just getting to hang out with my son and my husband like playing the pool. Like that's my absolute favorite thing in the world because we have so much fun and it's just so playful. And I think that, um, you know, strategically what we've had to do is like for me too, because I struggle with like play. I've struggled with play because I come from a background of being a workaholic perfectionist. Like my play was not really part of my life, I'd say, especially growing up. Like I was very disciplined as a dancer. I had to be. That was just, I was very professional from a young age. And so I didn't really have that play time to just like be a kid, you know? And so um, now it's almost like I have to schedule play. I have to be like, okay, I have this intentional time with my son. Um, we're going to play. And then I'm going to do something that's really playful. So for me, like dance is really playful. So I'll go take a dance class or I'll go hang out with friends and plan something fun to do, like go tubing or I don't know, just do something that's like very um, different or out of the norm or adventurous. Like that stuff is what's really fun for me. I know your journey was, was heavy, but is there some gratitude now with, you know, you can be in a state of play, yes. be present with your kid and feel like, and, and appreciate it more in a way because of what you went through. I was thinking that, thank, oh, yeah. thank God I'm not in that space anymore. So I use that for my, I had, oh, a, not, totally. I had a, you know, dark night of the soul as well. And I use yeah. that as like a, a, a memory bank of like, yes. when things are, actually just like a back thing of like, thank God I'm here now. Right, you know, it's right, like right. a reference point. And like, if anything even is bad, right. now I use it as like, holy shit, like the, thank God, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like it makes you appreciate life so much more and the good moment is so much more. Um, and when you, I think, I think that you can't really feel love and joy to the highest capacity if you've not felt the depth of pain and sorrow and despair. I think that emotion, you can't just you have to feel it all. If you want to feel the joy, you got to feel the pain too. There's, um, otherwise you're, you're just stuck here right in the middle, which I think a lot of people are just here, you know, they're not willing to feel the depth. And so they're not really getting to the high either. And so, um, through all the pain, through all the challenge, it's been so worth it because of all the lessons I've learned, but also that, um, it lets me, it allows me to appreciate everything so much more. The little things like getting to like digest food, <laughs> like getting to eat a meal and be like, wow, this is really good. And my body's going to digest it. And I'm not going to have an anxiety attack about it. Wow. Like that's so cool. That's so cool. But that's like the little things that we take for granted, the little things. So like your, in your experience, your capacity for joy and love skyrocketed after you went through this, this darkness. I think that it, it skyrocketed like in my initial, like really big healing journey with okay. ayahuasca. And it definitely has now, I feel like I'm almost with my nervous system. I'm learning how to, because I'm having to relearn how to regulate my nervous system. There are some experiences like the joy is so much that my system starts to kind of go into freak out mode too. And so I'm learning how to navigate that now and be like, Hey, I want to be like celebrating and all this and be like super high, high energy and high joy. But my body still has somewhat of a fight or flight response around that sometimes. And so that's still something I'm working through to some extent, but Absolutely. Like I know when I'm on the other side of this nervous system stuff I'm working through, like my range is going to be huge. <laughs> and I struggle with nervous system stuff too. You do? Yeah. Okay. When I was, uh, every night till I was about 11, I had an asthma attack every night where I was oh, wow. about to die. Like, <clears throat> like that. Whoa. And I had bad eczema. So I was covered. I woke up covered in blood too. That was the first 12 years, 10, 11 years of my life. Whoa. So my nervous system got addicted, not addicted, like used to like predicting death. Yeah. Like any any second, I could have been like, wow. I'm out the count. So, wow. the work's been for me, my nervous system, you know, regulating it and the importance of that. 
how have you gone about your journey where are you, where you are with it now and how have you just because for me I had no idea about anything to do with nervous system stuff that's and it I, I know my own benefits now but in your experience how has it changed your life in healing it yeah well so post explant like that's when I was forced into the world of somatics because I had no idea what I was going through I was like what is happening I am ex- I feel so I feel like I'm going crazy I have so many emotions I'm stuck in fighter I didn't even know that I was stuck in fight or flight I had no idea I just knew that I was like stuck somewhere and I couldn't get out of it. And so I ended up reaching out to um, my good friend, Will Rezin. You might know Will. I did a podcast with him. Yeah, I yeah, love Will. And um, his business partner, Ariana, I've known them for years. And so prior to this experience, he had let me know on Facebook. He was like, hey, Amber, I know you're going through like a big surgery. Like I'm here if you need me. Um, and thank God he said that because I didn't know I, I didn't really know who to turn to. I reached out to him. I reached out to some other somatic experts in town. And I was like, help me. I, I don't know what to do. And they were like, cool. They came over. They like were regulating me, holding my you know hands on my body, like helping me regulate, helping me understand what I was going through and why the emotions were moving the way that they were. Um, and so that started my journey into somatics. And I worked with Will for about a year. Yep, a year. I saw him every week for a year. And he helped me learn tools and just understand. Like, I think he helped me really understand logically what was happening. And that really helped me go, okay, I'm not going crazy. It's okay. Like, it's okay that my body's going through this. I need to, like, trust this. Logically, what is happening? Like, when you're in that state of, like, intense anxiety, what is happening? Yeah, so... um, your body is stuck in a fight or flight response. And until you um, find a way to come down, whether it's with breath, with looking around and being becoming present through all your senses and grounding in your physical body, whether that's through movement or through, um, yeah, taking a simple walk, like just, they're very simple things, but you have to basically show your body you're safe. And that can be really challenging when you are stuck in that space. Um, And so, um, yeah, I was just learning like very simple tools and, and trying to catch myself before I would go into that space. And, um, but it, it's crazy how the mind works because the mind wants to like understand everything and the mind wants to try to analyze what's happening. And, and the mind is running, running, running because the body is going through something. And so anyway, I had to learn that you got to fix the body for, or you got to chill the body out before the mind will calm down and it doesn't work. You think, oh, maybe I can think my way out of this. And really yeah, you yeah. can't. It's one of the tricky things about intelligence that when you're smart and you have a high yes. you know, IQ you get very good at you know convincing yourself or thinking you out of out of pain in a way right uh, very good at it. that's what been my experience and um, yeah it just makes it makes it worse it perpetuates it yes yeah it just makes you more crazy because you start yeah. going why is this happening you start cl- connecting all the dots and trying to figure it out and and so in those moments it's like okay mind like I hear you but this and I'm aware of you but I'm not going to let you take over this experience and and that's been that's been the work is to not let my mind carry away carry me away so what are the yeah. things you're doing in the moment to increase safety what are like your, your go-to tools for yeah. people listening that can drop into when they're kind of ramping up and feeling yeah. stressed out or anxious um deep breaths so taking long slow deep breaths um be just becoming for me when i feel that heightened state of awareness i start to i really have to almost like close in my senses to some extent so what that means is oftentimes I'll like step out of the room. I'll go stand with my feet on the ground in nature. I'll look around and look at and, you know, identify things around me, which is basically bringing me back into the present moment. I think about, or I tune into like, what am I hearing? What am I smelling? What am I tasting? What am I feeling? Like, you know, just bringing me back to this present moment. Also like movement, shaking, um, walking, dancing, like anything to kind of move the energy and get back into my feet and back into my body um, really helps, really helps me. So simple things like that. Um, And also I think reminding myself that like this will pass and I'm not stuck here. So if if you're in that headspace where you can do that, sometimes you're not. But if you can get to that headspace of like repeating affirmations, um, I'm safe, I'm loved, I'm okay, I will get through this, like this will pass, trust the process, feel the emotions, like that sort of inner self dialogue, kind of inner cheerleading has been really helpful too. But sometimes I'm, I'm, I don't have that capacity because my brain is already like on a spiral. So it's like, then I got to do physical stuff. Yeah, I had a anxiety, one of the leading anxiety experts on here, and he said one thing that changed my perspective on all this. He said yeah. that, when you're in an anxious state, your nervous system is, is on overload, your prefrontal cortex and your brain shuts down. Like you, yeah. your ability, the ability to actually be logical, yes. it, it races. Yes. Like until you, <laughs> factually, he studies in a lab, a college I went to, that until you kind of calm down and get into your body, 
your brain's not going to work. Yes. So it's, it's quite literally useless to think about your anxiety when you're anxious because your ability to think is decimated. Love it, so yes. So you actually have to get into your, your body and, and calm down. And then, and then your actual prefrontal cortex start working again, which is your logic, and then you're, you're good to go. But right. Before I switch topics com completely, do you have any, any closing message or uh, words from your heart towards women or, or people going through a similar journey to you in terms of, you know, breast implants or, or yeah. completely allowing yourself to crash or mothers, do you have anything yeah. left in your heart with that that you want to speak speak to? Um yeah, I think I think just really learning to honor to honor your body, to listen to your body, to really trust your intuition because I, I knew I needed those implants out earlier. And I didn't trust it. You know, I had friends who were getting really sick with BII and I was like, oh, pure denial. Oh, like that's just her. That's her. Like my, I'm fine. These are not affecting me. Like I'm fine. And if I'm really honest, and I really look back at the years leading up to that, I was deteriorating. I was, but I thought it was aging. I'm like, okay, I'm 38, so I thought like, oh, maybe I'm just like my skin's changing, my my bags under my eyes. Like, I don't know, maybe this is just aging. And now I know better. But like, I think that listen, trusting your intuition, trusting the signals from your body, connecting to your body enough that you are aware of what's going on, and that you have you know, this sense of, of self and this sense of connection to self that you can actually really know what's going on in your body. Like that's, that's, I think is really, really key. What was deluding you? What do you think was making you not see what was going on? Um, I, I so badly wanted to believe that I was going to escape that potential outcome, that I was like the rare one that wasn't going to get sick from mine. And, and, and back then also, I think I thought, I believed that only very rarely did people get sick from implants, which is not the case at all. Hundreds of thousands of women around the world are currently sick or dying from breast implant illness, um, or the cancers and autoimmune diseases that come from it. And women just don't know, because there's not really much awareness around it. Unless you go into Facebook groups with hundreds of thousands of women, or you're, you know, actively looking for it, you're not going to find it. And thank God there's a lot of celebrities now who are sharing their healing journeys after explant. And they're, um, Danica Patrick is, is one that, um, I've, I've gotten to know Danica here and there, um, uh, over a couple different, um, you know, just hangouts with her and she's such an incredible human being, but her story alone was so powerful and shifting people's awareness around it. And so, so millions of women are waking up to this being a potential problem, but big pharma does everything they can to suppress that. So that that's this that's a struggle is that you're you're battling something like big pharma that is like they're making billions, so they're going to try to censor women like us who are trying to speak out about their products. So you believe that basically every woman who has implants should take them out. I, I do. I do believe that at some point they're going to have health issues from them because all, all they are toxic. Take. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Well, just in and of itself, putting a foreign object in your body, your body will start attacking it immediately because it's foreign. So no matter what, even if you never have an autoimmune disease or develop cancer from it, your body is attacking that thing 24-7, 365 for as long as you have them. So your immune system is, is radically affected by that. And not only that, but like they're leaching chemicals and toxins into your body. So you might not feel that for years. It took me 18 years to get to a place where it was enough of a thing, right? Um, some women are sick immediately, especially mm -hmm. with the newer implants. The newer implants they claim are safer. They're not safer. They're silicone and they're textured. So they actually cause more problem. And people are like, I know women who were sick immediately when they got them in and had to take them out a couple, couple years later. So I actually feel kind of lucky I had mine <laughs> in 18 years ago. I think they were safer back then. But um, yeah, so I think in general, um, just listening to the stories of other women, doing your own research, considering just being open, just being open to potentially this could be a thing um, is for you and your body is, is really important because women are dying of breast, and can breast cancer, multiple forms of breast cancer, um, and dealing with major autoimmune diseases. Um, and they have no idea that the root of it is their breast implants. They're actually putting breast implants in women who have had breast cancer and have had mastectomies. <laughs> That's actually a very, very, very common thing is they tell them after they give them a mastectomy, like, oh, well, don't you want to, you know, have breasts again? Well, here's some implants. It's like you're giving them cancer again. That's basically what you're doing. So is there any censorship of women speaking out against it? There's censorship across all the platforms yeah. on that. So when you when you tag wow. the breast implant illness, when you tag BII, you're no being way. censored. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No. Because big pharma, like I said, they're making a lot of money off these implants, and they there is a ton of data on it. The FDA already has a black box warning on implants, um, which means that like the black box warning basically lists all the potential negative side effects. Um, they've now acknowledged that certain types of cancer come from breast implants, that autoimmune diseases are caused. Some of them are caused by breast implants. 
So it's out there, but you have to look for it. Like you can't just, you're not going to walk into a plastic surgeon office and they're like, here's all the data. Like, no, because they're making millions in their personal practice off these implants, right? They're not going to do that. Sadly, sadly, I think it's extremely unethical and low integrity, but that's what they're doing. They really should be giving women informed consent. Like this is all the stuff that you need to consider before you put these things in your body. But even women who see all that information may not choose to listen to it because they still want the physical shift to happen. And again, like all you can do is bring is build awareness and share things and share information and give people information so that they can make informed decisions. And at the end of the day, they're still going to make the decision that they want to make. And so that's their journey, you know? Now this segues well into the next topic I want to talk about that, yeah. you know, you seem very comfortable with talking about things that have shame or most people don't want to talk about, whether it be politically or with your you know, implants, things like that. Yeah. And most people actually, be, I think, believe um, things that they don't want to talk about or they shouldn't talk about yeah, and they hide it and shame it. So in your experience, what, what, did it, what did it take for you to be able to speak freely with no fear and no sense of fearing judgment of other people's opinion? Yeah. How did you get there? It's been a journey because I remember when I first started writing online like 16 years ago, I was so afraid of what people would think of me. Like, that's why I was such a perfectionist. I was like, okay, if I say it this way, am I going to offend somebody? Am I going to like, I don't know. And what I learned through all of my work online, coaching, running retreats, like through all that marketing and sales, what I learned was that the more real I am, the more people can connect to me, the more vulnerable, the more courageous, the more honest, the more transparent I am. Not only do I get the benefit of being able to be myself, but I actually attract the right people to my coaching, to my retreats. And that was really important to me because let me tell you, I had some bad, bad eggs show up to my retreats or my coaching. I'm like, whoa, these are not my ideal class customers or clients. What am I doing to attract these people? Well, I'm, I'm putting on a facade. I'm putting on an affront of perfection yeah. that is attracting a certain type of person. And so I had to learn through that, like, oh, wow, like I, I really want soulmate clients. I want people who really know me, love me, get me. And then we're going to have a great connection in our work together. And also, like, I think that transparency and honesty are required for trust. And so if someone's going to trust you with <laughs> you bringing them down to the jungle to send ayahuasca ceremonies for a week, like they need to trust you. And that requires a certain level of transparency, honesty, and integrity. And so for me, those are just like really important values for me. They've become really important values for me. But initially, I really struggled with that. I really wanted to be perfect. I really wanted everybody to like me. I really wanted to say all the right things. And then, you know, I just got to, I think in general, I'm just, <laughs> I have, I tend to have pretty passionate opinions about things. Yeah. And, um, and because of all of the ch struggle and the challenges I've been through in my life and the things I've learned, I want to share the things that I've learned in the hopes of helping other people. And oftentimes the things that I've learned are pretty controversial, right? Like, okay, I learned breast implants can kill you. Okay, I learned, you know, and, and even I've been vegan for 14 years. Even being vegan can be very controversial and people are like, people attack me all the time for being vegan. And I'm like, yo, I'm just eating plants. Why are you getting angry at me, right? But people, there's just a lot of projection and a lot of, you know, online in general. But being online has forced me to deal and, and to come to some sort of like, acceptance inside that like people are going to project onto me. They're going to think I'm X, Y, Z because I'm only showing them a very small fraction of reality, of my reality. And as much as I'm honest and transparent and all the things, like they're only still seeing this much of me. And so that's to be expected, right? And then when I met JP, I was like, oh God, <laughs> he has so many haters and so many trolls and people coming after him all the time. And he really taught me so much about this. He was just like, Amber, like if you one thing that he said that I, I'm probably going to butcher this, but something along the lines of if you, if you need the validation for like the likes and the follows, then you're going to be hurt by every amount of like criticism and hate that you get. Yeah. And so he had to learn to really just shut it all off. Like I don't need the likes and the love and all that. And so then I don't take the hate so personally. And he had to really just ignore his comment section for the two, last several years. Two sides years. of the same coin. I noticed that. that. Yeah. If you let comments of praise get to you, you're going to let comments of insults get to you. It's the same thing. That's it. It's the same. And 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 also, like, we're human and people are going to say shit that triggers us and we're going to be like, oh, that's so painful. Um, and and I, so I've, I've had to, he, where he, he tends to take the approach of like, I'm just going to ignore it. I tend to, on my, on my page, I tend to be more like, hey guys, like, let's, let's 
do our best to not project onto each other, to not like hate and, and, and create this division between each other. Like, can we just all get along, even though we might not agree all the time? And so, um, I share all of my opinions and they may be right or wrong, depending on who's listening, right? And whoever has different perspectives about it. But I think it's really, really important that we all speak our truth, that we all share. If we're feeling passionate about something and feel like this, I really need to stand for this. This is really a value of mine. This is something I want to share. This is my truth. I really, then, then I think the most important thing to do is to do that, is to share that, is to like put that out into the world. And, um, I think I've just developed that over time, that I know that my voice is important, even though other people might not agree with me or criticize or judge me. Like I need to be me. And I think the most, the, I think the most powerful gift you can give the world is being your most authentic, vulnerable, transparent, you know, empowered version of yourself. And if you, if you do that, you give other people the gift of like going, Oh, I could do that too. Or I could, I could, you know, share my voice and I matter too, you know? And so we have to embody what we preach. And, um, and we have to show up in a way that's going to, um, I think, inspire other people to show up for themselves and to speak their truth and to do those things. So I'm trying to really embody what I've learned. Have you lost any friends or people you care about due to what you believe in? Um, I'd say that, thank, thank God, I don't think I've lost true friends or family, to, gratefully, like through the whole COVID debacle. Um, Luckily, the people we have in our life, um, family and friends, um, that didn't divide us, thank God, because I know it really divided so many families and so many friends. Um, it was like black or white for... It divided mine. Yeah, 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 like no doubt. I've heard stories from friends. I'm super grateful that like my parents are in California. They were in that whole kind of California scene for a while while we're in Texas and there's just like, there's a big divide, right? And, and JP and I have been very vocal about our opinions on COVID and that whole process. And, and they, they just respect it. They're like, look, you guys have your way and that's cool, but we're going to do our thing and that's cool. But there's a mutual respect of like, we can agree to disagree and still love each other. And I think that's I'm really it. grateful yeah. that our families both feel that way. You know, yeah, that's the thing I actually causes me the most pain is because with my experience, just like adults is noticing that separation is an illusion it, right it, it doesn't exist like how how can we say like this is what the we're trained to believe now that if someone believes in something different to us whether different political party or different opinion on covid that that creates the illusion of separation that this person no longer is a, uh, similar to me they're, they're a foreign alien who's a hater who's, right. a, who's an evil person that to me is is the most destructive concept of humanity literally this illusion of of separation so and the, the ultimate solution is that we're not all going to agree on anything you know right. we, even, Absolutely. I mean, even you and i'm sure we agree on many things i'm sure something we disagree on right and yes the fact that that one thing over a million can divide people to me is is, is insanity it makes it makes yeah. zero sense and it, that's why when i started this i made the intention i want to talk to anyone no matter what they believe in yeah just to remove that the barricade that we that we share right now i think that's super super wise i think that's what we need right now more than ever i think they're intentionally trying to divide and conquer us very very clearly and from what i can see so i think that's that's the work is to like how can i and i think that's something that i've had to learn in my marriage with jp and something a lot of people go like oh my god how are you vegan and he's like a total carnivore and i'm like <laughs> you know in my head i don't think about it being a problem but a lot of people are like that would like really be hard for me like no like we we can respect each other for our beliefs and our philosophies in life but like we can still love each other we're just not gonna do exactly what each other does. Like we don't have, he doesn't have to be a vegan for me to love him and vice versa, you know? Yeah, love doesn't care about that. Love doesn't care about who you voted for. In, in right, 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 right. Love doesn't care about different diets. Love doesn't care right. about your opinions on some political issue. It doesn't, it's it's strange. It doesn't, it has no alignment with anything to do with love, that, that concept. Right, right, right. I think a lot of people, myself included early on in my life though, I thought that like, in order to accept someone, I had to agree with them. Like in order for me to, you know, and, and that's, I think just growth and maturity that you realize like, nah, that's like not true at all. <laughs> what are some of the most important things you need, you think we have to wake up about in reality right now? Oh, wow. Um, I think that we have to focus on sovereignty, right? Self-sovereignty. And a lot of, a lot of the work that we want to happen at a collective level, right? In our government, in our local communities, uh, in the world at large with all the failing systems and all the corruption, all that, like, that is a huge external problem, but it comes from an internal problem um, of just feeling, you know, not never doing trauma work, never, never doing healing work, never focusing on self, never doing self development, never like it comes from this, this lack of development inside. Um, 
And so for me, I think that the, the key work to sovereignty right now is to free yourself of all the patterns and programs and the things that enslave you internally, right? Like the mental programs, um, the emotional work, the, the trauma that we carry, um, our generational trauma, like that's the work that is going to free us up individually and also collectively. And I think that that's the work a lot of people are avoiding right now. It's really easy to project out and be like, oh, that person and that person, like the divide and conquer thing is happening. And, um, and I think in order for us to come together in a more unified, like culture and, and community, we need to be doing that inner work for ourselves. It's a good thing. I think most people will go straight to, you know, the external stuff like uh new world order or being, aware. it's good to be aware of that stuff, but yeah. the ultimate biggest thing is to heal yourself, right? That's, that's yeah. the, the number one thing. Because it's it's the cause of all. My journey. I used to be, you know, a, a super um, woke, uh, like a intense uh, liberal. And for me, what changed me to be where I am now isn't belief. It's my it's my trauma. Is that mm. like what made me neutral and be able to be yeah. stoic and talk to people with love and not ever get reactive over a comment or an opinion. Like never ever now. But before I was like oh, blowing up. And right. It was truly due to trauma. It was mm. just that I did not know how to regulate myself. Right, right. I was internalizing all this this hatred of myself right. and all these these negative feelings. And so what made me a better citizen and more loving and, and aware of certain things was not yeah, the education helped of, of reading certain books and things, of becoming aware of all this nefarious agendas. But what helped the most was just healing my trauma, healing my nervous system. Because then the reactivity just, just disappeared. Like yes, I think no one with, with healthy nervous system or, or healing anything whatever common hate or, you know, Agreed. divisive things. It just, it starts within. Agreed. Agreed. A thousand percent. And, and so I think that a lot of people are trying to figure out how do, how do we get out of this mess that we're in? Like, how do we fix all the systems? How do we rebuild a new world? Cause it feels like the old world's crumbling and it is very yeah. clearly. So how do we rebuild? And I think we have to start with ourselves there. Uh, and yes, we have to build community. We have to work together. We have to f be able to accept and love each other through all of our differences for sure. But that work, like you said, has to happen inside. What's it? Do any fear with um, your kid, like with with the way the the world's going, or how he may get yeah. indoctrinated if he, as he goes up with schools or, or TikTok and things like that? Totally. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that JP and I became so vocal once we had our son. Like we were already vocal about COVID, but I was pregnant during the whole like first year of COVID, and becoming a parent really like turned it up a notch. For JP, I know for sure, his provider, like, protector came on <laughs> big time. And he was like, not for my son. We both were like, we don't want this world for our son. This is not how, he's not going to grow up wearing a mask. He's not going to grow up not not getting to go and do, do things because he's not vaccinated or whatever the thing is. Like, we want him to grow up with the same freedoms that we had. And so that's why we started really being vocal and standing up and starting to say something um, during that time. And so I think that, like, the world that our son is growing up in is so different from what we experienced. And I think about these kids nowadays on their tablets and their phones, and I'm just like, especially the girls growing up with all that um, kind of self-image stuff that they're already going to be dealing with, but then now they've got it like tenfold from all their different social media uh, platforms. And so I, I worry about kids nowadays a thousand percent. And what we're trying to do with our son is like, modulate it to the best that we can knowing that he's going to be exposed to it to some extent but we we can protect him from a lot of it and the first thing we can do is either homeschool him or put him in like a great school that's going to be more of um a free thinking f yeah. sovereign focused <laughs> education system that's going to teach him real life skills that he's can he can use and we want to teach him those things like for me i'm already teaching him gardening and animal care and like all the things that i'm doing on the ranch i want him to learn and embody and all those things because those are things I wish I knew. I wish I knew how to cook and plant and take care of animals growing up. And like, I, I would have loved to have learned that stuff. What's especially worrying about this to me is that, you know, your generation, my generation, I'm much younger than you, still had mass suffering and body image issues, but yeah. right now it's on steroids. You Agreed. said that already, but what makes me more concerned is that the concentration of pharmaceuticals available right now is insane. And yes. the more that younger kids go, crazy in that way the more they're going to be drowned with with pharmaceuticals okay. that was my experience uh, yeah you know i was i was on nine pharmaceuticals when i was 21 so oh my gosh yeah, my experience with that was pretty easy right like i just went in one day like i'm depressed and then the wow next, in about a couple of months i was on nine different uh, medications and then it's not, not surprising but crazy yeah but then for me i was like that's oh, just my experience but then i talked to many people who go on pharmaceuticals and it's that it's that fast and i also wow. know you know 10 year olds who are on you know ADHD medication, right. Xanax at, at that young, right. because it's based on, you know, 
of course you're going to be mentally incapable when you're on TikTok all day, you know, watching videos of people that you think look better than you or richer than you. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's not good. Oh gosh. And I think, I think also, I think technology, it can be very much an addiction. I mean, I, I, I know, notice these patterns in myself yeah, where I'm like here. connected to my Instagram. I'm like, okay, like the amount of time and energy that we put into our phones nowadays is honestly shocking. When you look at how many hours you're on your phone, I'm like, oh God, I need to go on like a social media detox or put my phone away more. And my son is really good at like helping me be present yeah. and putting my phone away because as soon as I reach for my phone, he wants to watch it. And I'm like, okay, now phone's going away. <laughs> computer's going away because now he's only two and a half, but now he knows like, oh, if Amber, if mom's got her phone or the computer, that means I get to watch a YouTube video. That's like a, it's a kid's show, but still. Um, and so already we're we're dealing with like okay we're gonna put all the devices away he's only two and a half but if he as soon as he sees them he wants them because he knows that fun comes from them right and so that's already something that we're battling and so i know why parents are like uh, i know there's like a, i think it's called a gobo phone but you can actually purchase phones for kids that are just a phone it's just phone and text messaging it's no apps and so they can have a phone and stay connected to friends but they don't get to access the internet and that to me i think is one way to like help your kids with this technology thing moving forward. But then like you talk about AI and you're like, I have no idea where that's going or how that's going to infiltrate our lives or how that's going to affect them too. I, yeah, it's tough because it's also like to some degree, I wouldn't want to have my kid have any access to the same things, but at the same time, it's tricky because the world's become that in, yeah. in a way that how they're going to be able to you know fit in and, and move at the pace. So, right. you know, kids, I don't know if it's an advantage, but it's an observation that kids, their brain just moves so fast right, right now because they're used to just like short, media gratification all the time so right. brains are like always working at a fast rate right so it's like maybe this competitive advantage like that they have based on technology so it's just how are you managing that like thinking okay you yeah. know is he not going to fit in if he doesn't have this this um access to these technologies and is it better if he has no access to them yeah. are, you, are you more in the wavelength yeah. of just like right now nothing hands off like right no, right no now it feels like he gets to like watch educational stuff that's yeah. teaching him or like animal videos you know if he gets the baby tigers like cool he's into that but like I think that we're going to have to find our dance with it because we do want him to have, if he wants to build a business, he needs to know how to build a website and be online and do social media, like all the things that we've had to learn in our lives as business owners. So that we want him to have certain skills, but I think that especially at such formulative ages, like during this, you know, first 10, 18 years of his life, like I think the actual detriment to the mind, all those dopamine hits, like training kids to be so ADD with their attention, like that's actually going to, I think, do more damage than, than the benefits would be of him being on the platforms. And I think that that's why a lot of like tech giants, people that own Google and Twitter and whatever, like their kids are not on platforms. And that tells you a lot about <laughs> what you need to know about them because they know how addictive they are. They know how much they change like people's brain chemistry and how, how, um, how much they let's say, change your perspective about things too. I mean, you think about the algorithms and how they feed you what you want. And so then you're very much in an echo chamber of all the things that you want. And you know, yeah. what does that do to our psyche? Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of unknown questions there. <laughs> how have you noticed in, in your son's evolution that he's different to maybe other kids based on you giving him time on in land or with animals or being more into nature versus someone who's raised on more so technology how is your son different in his personality to someone you think that is raised more so on tv and ipads um it's hard to know because i have not spent a ton of time okay. around kids but and he's only two and a half but what i do know is my son is he loves to be outside just instinctually like he would live outside if i let him <laughs> he would sleep outside too loves being outside especially if it's not you know 110 degrees yeah. like it's been um he loves being outside and he's always been that way and i think that as parents our our job is to just support what he wants to be doing and like okay you want to be outside great let's do it you know but um i'm grateful that that was the natural instinct i think that most kids are that way though and i think a lot of kids find device or they're given devices to keep them distracted or whatever because the parents need a break and then they ended up getting really connected and addicted to that instead of wanting to go outside and be in nature and so i think our role as parents is to be like okay i know you want this but really let's go play outside and that's why like when we were growing up like our kids our parents would just lock us outside go play outside for three hours and that's what we did like we didn't have devices so it was easy for them to do that but i think now we have to really work on our boundaries with technology in order to be able to be better parents with our kids. Yeah, that's good. That's a good side of it. They have to lead by example. That, that, oh, that's it. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Because he catches me every time I'm on yeah. my phone. He's just like, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, damn it. I put how it away. That, how has that concept helped you change your behavior that, you know, I think it's a motivator in the sense that like, I can't 
get away with the same shit I've been always doing, that there's someone here that is kind of like a, he's not a militant person making you do it, but his presence and, and knowing that you have to be the right parent for him, yeah. how is it healthy to be more disciplined in like all your habits and, and, yeah. and self-care routines? Yeah, it's forced me to because it's it's made it so challenging to fit it in. Like self care, especially this first couple of years, was so challenging to fit in that it like I've never had a challenge really with self care. Like I was always good at going to the gym every day, always good at taking you know, and because I had all the time in the world, <laughs> running a business and being married, like it was like I had all this time. And now that I have a son, it's completely different. I had to like get really efficient and really productive with my time. Like okay, if I only have an hour, then like. Okay, nobody bother me for an hour. I'm going to go do this self-care here. I'm going to get this work done or whatever it is. So it's forced me to be really, really efficient. Um, but also it's forced us to embody what we preach so much more. You know, JP and I have had to go, okay, like if we want our son to learn how to regulate his emotions, we need to regulate our emotions. We need to learn how to stay calm when he's reactive. Like, I swear that's been my deepest work as a mother is like when my son is screaming and trying to hit me or whatever, how do I stay regulated in that? Um, and how do I stay calm so that he can come back to baseline faster, you know? And cause if I go big, he's going to go bigger and that is just going to create this ripple effect. So the emotional intelligence work and the regulation work that you have to learn as a parent is, is really next level. That's probably the best parenting advice I've heard that you can hear is that you kind of have to parent yourself you do first and in that process become a better parent to your, your child right because you show oh, up yeah if you show up like the parents like all, all love to him but all i got was like the, my dad at the end of the day who was like at like 9 p.m from work who was already dead and frustrated i got that right. i only saw that side of him right growing up right, right. my mom me, me too i only mm -hmm. saw her when she was super stressed and anxious right because that's when i had time to see her during the day right and that was my experience with them right you know, i mean a lot different if i saw them they're like hey you know half an hour just to calm down and breathe and take a second to the gym or something that I would have had a way different experience with them. That's it. And that's what you're they would have been so happier people. You. you would have yeah, yeah. felt more calm and, and regulated in yourself. Like, yeah. and that that's, that's, I think, you know, there's such strong mirrors for us. They really should. Cause if, if we get big, if we get activated, they get activated. So you really have to like, okay, how do I, and it's really hard. It's hard when you're exhausted, you're overwhelmed, you're underslept all the things and you've got to somehow pull it together. I yeah. think life hack in general, I think that, you know, the more you prioritize yourself and your habits and you get yourself at a high frequency Correct. to go into the day with, things just end up getting better, you end up attracting things that are on your level, end up giving better sides of you. But before I just show up with no preparation to life and just put on a mask, like act like the way I was supposed to act, I didn't feel it. Right. And that separation caused a lot of pain. But now where I'm not acting, I just feel good. Right. And I get good in a way in that, in that sense. And yeah. That split isn't fun when you're pretending to feel good and you're not feeling good. Oh, it's so yeah. true. It's so true. And I, I, that's what I've had to really like come to terms with it. Like through this whole healing process is like, if I'm not feeling good, I can put on a smile and, and, but if someone asks me how I'm doing, I'm going to be real yeah. because if I'm not real with myself, then I'm again, putting up this facade and that only hurts me yeah. and it only hurts other people because they don't actually get to see the real you either. And it doesn't, it doesn't relate any sort of real humanness to anybody. If you're just like, oh, I'm fine. I'm putting on this show. Everything's fine. I'm perfect. And you're like really dying inside. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's just, it's not real. And I think I'm just really, really committed to being real right now. Fair enough. Well, yeah. I just want to thank you for, for coming on. And kudos to you for, for healing everything you've, you've done. It's, it's a lot of work. Thank and you. Just, and just feeling, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty severe empath. Just feeling all the you know, emotions you were experiencing in that moment. And, um, to be where you are now yeah there's a lot a lot of work you know yeah, just thank so you. congratulations and thank i know you. it's still a process it is um but it, it takes a lot to, to do it through because most people would just kind of either give up, give up at that point or just kind of be okay with staying in that space of like you know what i'm gonna feel like shit forever it's whatever yeah or i'm gonna take some pills so i don't feel it yeah and i think that was my commitment to myself is like i could take antidepressants i could take i could do those things but I really want to work through what this is. What is this really? Is this is this trauma? Is it what is this? Because if I can figure it out, then maybe I can help other people figure it out. You know. So that's I think where I'm going is like, how can I give this back? How can I give what I've learned back? But I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That's yeah. like, that has become the biggest hack for me when I'm going through shit. Is right. I'm a you know conduit for it sounds insane, but for the universe in a way that sure. whatever I learn here is. Uh, teachings for someone else uh, you know? totally and i can use this totally. unfortunately in my own experience not only yes. teach myself and evolve my karma but also to to educate people totally so totally there, there could be a lot of education from this absolutely teach yourself thank you again I, yeah uh, thanks I really for having me it. appreciate of course, it of course.
I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to watch more content, please click this video right here and don't forget to subscribe right here. Thank you.